Welcome to you. I'm from here. That's right. Yeah, and I don't have any kind of cool title in front of my name. so We can make something up. We'll come up with something good. First of all, I have to lead off with the, the biggest news of yesterday. And, and, of course, I'm talking about the Kansas City Chiefs defeating the Buffalo <laughs> You know, my husband's from Kansas City, and uh, we are diehard Chiefs fans. We uh, had uh, quite the tumultuous evening last night. We were up. We were down. Um, our youngest cried twice, stormed out of the room. Uh, our oldest asked my husband to stop yelling at the TV. So we covered a lot of ground during that game, but uh, really excited that the Kansas City Chiefs pulled off the win and look forward to watching them win in the Super Bowl, too. So. I like bold predictions, so, I yeah. I, uh, I saw you on Face the Nation yesterday morning while uh, we were preparing for today, and uh, I will only ask you one thing. We're here today to talk about national, as you call it, parental choice week. So uh, we're going to spend all of our time on that today. I will ask you one just 30,000-foot view question. Given the events of the last 24, 48 hours, uh, politically speaking, how do you see things unfolding in 2024? Well, obviously, I have an extremely biased opinion on this topic. Uh, I've been very public. Uh, I've endorsed President Trump. And I think as you see uh, the race getting closer to November, a lot of support consolidating around him. Um, I think it's a clear matchup between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Again, very biased in my opinion here, especially after serving two and a half years in the Trump administration. The Contrast, this race is very different, I think, than a lot of presidential elections in the past because you have two people who actually have presidential records to run on. Um, and for me, it's very clear one has a record of success, one doesn't. And I think uh, Donald Trump will continue to consolidate support, not just from Republicans, but from people who are looking for something different and likely win in November. You have had a tremendous first year. I was reading uh, some of the statistics specifically to... Uh, parental choice, um, but I, I want to go over some other things. Uh, this is a really remarkable thing. You've cut taxes in the state of Arkansas by $300 million, both business and personal. That was one of the first items on your agenda. I, if you could, just for the people in the back of the room, could you say one more time that we had a tremendous first year? I just want to make sure everybody gets that down. Uh, I'm really proud of what we were able to accomplish in the first year. We had very clear priority list going into that first legislative session. Um, it's probably one of the craziest, busiest times, uh, certainly of my life. You go from election day in November to building a legislative plan and strategy, building a staff, moving your family, planning for Thanksgiving and Christmas, an inauguration, all those things happen. And so you hit, you need to hit the ground running on day one because right after you're sworn in, you go immediately into that first legislative session. And so it was really important for me that we have good relationships with members of the legislature. And we spent a lot of the time during the campaign uh, building up those relationships so that we could implement what we felt like were very bold conservative reforms on education, on tax cuts, uh, on our criminal justice system through the PROTECT Act. And then one of the, the last and big priorities, kind of the, the more fun, least controversial piece, is kind of that quality of life that everybody looks for. Um, and we really wanted to elevate and invest in our state's outdoor economy um, and living up to our state motto of being the natural state and seeing that side of our state grow and expand. And so that was one of the final places that we really leaned into. And I'm proud to say that we accomplished something really big in each one of those four spaces. in just a bit. Uh, many of them leaders. Do I get to pick which ones we call yeah, Absolutely. Them? You're, there, are you're, there are a couple I know out there. You run the show. Sure I'm yeah. I got a couple questions for some of them too. Maybe. Oh, I love it. I love it. Uh, everyone in the room uh, for, uh, in one way or another is connected to uh, the Christian education movement. And uh, certainly the Herzog Foundation is dedicated to expanding and growing Christian education. I know your faith is deeply important to you. And so I would just ask you specifically, um, what does the role of Christian education mean to you in 2024? Well, you know, I think it's a, certainly a very personal thing. As, as governor of the entire state, um, while I am an unapologetic believer and am very outspoken about my faith and never try to shy away from that, I also don't want to impose that 
uh, on a family who may feel differently. However, I do think it's important for um, families who do want that opportunity uh, for their child to receive a Christian education or even just uh, certain types of instructions if they uh, struggle with a learning disability, whatever that family needs to meet uh, the demands of their student. I think that's the modern day of education that we find ourselves in. And we need to do a better job of helping make sure every student has a pathway to success. Uh, and personally, I love the idea of those values being reinforced, but that's not necessarily going to be the case for every family in the state of Arkansas. So while I want that opportunity to exist, I don't want to impose that on any particular family. You were one of oh, just a handful of governors that's managed to pull off universal school choice. Um, no small feat. And as Daryl mentioned just a bit ago, um, even some of your Republican governors across the country haven't been able to figure out how to do it, even with Republican majorities. Yeah, how just like, again, the record to reflect that Chris said that, not me. <laughs> I didn't call out other Republican governors who haven't gone down that road. If, if you had them here, how might you counsel other Republican governors? How did you achieve it? And I would speak specifically to Republicans. I, I think we understand maybe more Democrats' objections. What about Republicans' objections to universal school choice? Have you heard them, and what are they? And how well, would you I've talk them out of it? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, I think one of the, the biggest things for us is we went really big really early. Um, one, we had, I think another key piece of it is having really good partnerships. Uh, Keith Brooks, who is one of the members of our legislature, but also helped lead and was our uh, sponsor on the House side for Arkansas Learns is here. And having uh, one good leadership in both the House and the Senate on the legislation made a big difference, um, but it wasn't something we just dreamed up overnight. We spent uh, months building that piece of legislation, talking to stakeholders, building support, but also I spent two years campaigning on it. And so I knew that it was something, not just that we wanted to see happen, but frankly, that the people who had voted for me and other members, they were demanding it. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't be sitting here as the governor of the state because we barred uh, no moment to talk about this being the first and biggest priority that I had coming in as governor was to really flip our education system on its head. And to me, it was important that it wasn't just school choice. While that is an absolutely critical uh, and key component of Arkansas Learns, we wanted something that really took a comprehensive look at education and that we didn't just tinker with the system, but we flipped it on its head. I ran because I wanted to uh, change the way that we look at not just education, but government as a whole. I didn't want to maintain the status quo, but to really do things differently. So we spent the better part of those two years not just talking about education, but also researching best practices, what works, what doesn't, and then we put all of that into one piece of legislation. I think that helped make the difference. We covered everything from raising teacher salary, going from the very bottom in the country to top five overnight, to parental empowerment, to school safety, to getting rid of CRT and indoctrination. There was a little bit of something for everybody, which helped us build, I think, um, in many cases, almost an unlikely coalition of supporters for that piece of legislation. That's a huge point. You didn't go to war with public education. In fact, you bettered teacher salaries, as you say, from uh, on average $36,000 to $50,000 a year. So it wasn't as though you went to war with public education, which maybe is the misnomer about universal school choice, that it's somehow um, anti-public school. And I would just ask you, too, for people that really like their public school, they say, gosh, universal school choice is going to kill our small town rural schools. Um, you haven't found that to be true. Other states have not that have enacted this. A, a couple points on that. Not only was LEARNS not anti-public school, it's the largest investment that we've made as a state into our public schools in decades. We have not leaned in in that way, um, certainly not since my dad was governor. And so that was really important that it wasn't just again, about uh, that parental cho choice and opening up the education freedom accounts, but we also want to see our public schools succeed and do well. Competition breeds excellence. This is something we know in every area, every aspect of life, education should be no different. And so by building up both sectors, we expect 
to see a lot more success across the board. Um, one of the other big pieces that we really invested in was literacy. We know uh, what a huge determining factor that is for every student's long-term success. If a student can't read by that make or break moment, by the time they hit third grade, we're essentially setting them up for a lifetime of failure. We know that if students aren't hitting that benchmark, that they're not gonna have success long-term. And so we invested significantly in our public schools literacy and giving students that solid foundation. So far, we've already hired um, just under 80 literacy coaches that are being deployed uh, to districts around the state. Uh, we have the capacity to take that up by about another 45 literacy coaches already working on expanding that program because we know those are the things that make public schools stronger, better, and more competitive too with private schools. So we wanna see every sector do well. And um, to your point about people asking, my, my public school is really great, wonderful. Then keep sending your kids there. Um, we have a lot of great public schools here in the state of Arkansas. We want them to continue to do well. That's why we've invested the way that we have. And for many families, the public school is going to be the first and best choice. And that's a great thing because we want to see those schools and those communities continue to thrive. But for some families, that's not the case. And if it isn't, we want them to have the option to figure out where and how their child can best be at educated. And that means opening up options for charter schools, private schools, and even homeschool. And I've heard so far something you know, approaching 10,000 families have taken advantage of this, somewhere between six and 10,000 families have taken advantage. Yeah, you know, we're close to um, about 6,000 students that are currently enrolled in education freedom accounts across the state of Arkansas. Um, more than a hundred schools, many of which are represented here in the room today, have students that are part of the EFA program. That will open up in year two. We expect that to expand significantly and then be open to every student in the state by year three. Um, and we feel confident uh, that a lot of families will take advantage of that. And we're excited to see that program continue to grow and more and more students get the opportunity they need uh, to be successful. You having spent a lot of time in Washington, D.C. And, and the halls of the federal as government. As little as possible. <laughs> Not anymore, thankfully. You're here. Uh, but having seen that operation, and now as governor of Arkansas, I would just ask you kind of philosophically and generally, uh, the Department of Education in Washington, D.C., versus what you're trying to achieve in Arkansas. I hear this often. How much often. time do we have? Yeah. I, I hear often that people, uh, particularly Republicans who run, often say if they were going to eliminate one entity of the federal government, it would be the Department of Education. I'm not asking you that, well, so, but I'm asking so your opinion. In, in full disclosure, the very first job I had out of college was actually at the Federal Department of Education. Um, <laughs> I went to Washington thinking that uh, this would be my big moment. I was going to change the world uh, through my very, very low-level uh, position at the Department of Education. I found out very quickly the most I would probably change would be somebody's coffee. <laughs> and um, I learned very fast the uh, reason people get so frustrated with the Department of Education. Um, but one of my, my biggest takeaways and biggest reminders was that local is always best. Um, and so the more that we can put power into the hands of local entities, the better we're going to be able to serve students. Because what works in Arkansas may not be what works in Texas or Florida or New York or California. The same way that even within Arkansas, what works in Jonesboro may not work in Little Rock or Fayetteville or El Dorado. Um, and even smaller than that, I have three kids and what works for one of my kids may not work for the other two. And so the more that we can empower decisions at the local level, and to me there's nothing more local than a parent being empowered to make decisions, the better off that student is going to be and the better off that student is going to be served. So um, while I, I do think that there is some role for the Department of Education, um, the, the less power that they have, I'm going to be all for that. Um, and as a governor, I'd be more than happy if they just gave us all of the decision-making power and we didn't have to uh, follow any of, of their process. But I don't think that's happening right away. This will be my final question, Governor, and I want to turn it over to the audience. Sure. Um, and that is, on that point, uh, a lot of homeschoolers, you know, uh, at the foundation we talk a lot with Christian school educators and uh, home educators. 
Home educators are often leery of uh, universal school choice because they are concerned that it is somehow a camel's nose under the tent for, for government or state interference in their affairs. Could you speak to that? Sure, and, th and I think this applies not just to homeschool, but also um, a lot of the private schools. While I certainly support accountability, and I think it's absolutely critical if the state is providing some level of funding that there should be accountability measures put in place. Um, we don't want it to be a government-heavy operation. That's why it's an opt-in. You don't have to participate, whether you're a homeschool family or a private school, if you don't want to uh, follow the regulations and that accountability mechanism that we will lay out from the state level, then you can opt out. This isn't something that's mandated, that's forced, but if you want some level of funding from the state, then we want to make sure that that money is being spent appropriately and correctly. And I think that's a responsibility that we have as a government to, to manage those dollars, make sure that there's accountability in place. Uh, but if you don't want to participate, then certainly we're not going to force you to be part of the educational freedom accounts. You know, in all sincerity, you're very, very good at calling on people. Do you want to call on people like you used to? Do you sure. Want to, all right. Throw your hands up if you've got a question for the governor. And she'll Keith Brooks, you're not allowed to ask any questions. <laughs> <laughs> sure, Brad, go ahead. Uh, my name is Brad Jones. I'm with the Hitler Christian School. Um, we, uh, we have a unique school. It's a volunteer school. been in existence, but we were created this for over 40 years. And uh, we qualified for the National School Lunch Program and also 50% of our kids. It was great. Last year we got a, a thing that said we had to, with our equal opportunity, poster that we have to put up, which is fine, say that we had to uh, hire uh, sexual orientation as part of the discrimination. And we were like, whoa, you know, of course we discriminate on that as a Christian school. So my question is, in the Learners Act, have other states, when it's been passed, have there been amendments to the legislation when a different administration comes on board, different political parties in charge of the legislature? Because in our instance, I'm going to go from having volunteers to possibly with the Learns Act money, which we love, thank you for that, um, to paying them a little bit. But what if three years down the line, we're asked to do something we can't, and oh, what do we do? You know, our schools are just changed because of that. The, Does that make sense? I, I think so. The good news is three years from now, I hope to still be governor. Oh. So <laughs> you should be good. If seven years from now, you're on your own, Brad. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, but, but in all seriousness, certainly um, there's going to be things that are fluid. As much as we want uh, things like the banning of indoctrination and CRT that we put into Arkansas Learns, um, that doesn't mean that a future legislature and administration can't come behind us and make changes down the line. Um, but I think that's why it's important for people like yourself to engage um, and to continue to build those coalitions of support and make sure like-minded people are representing you in the legislature. Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, I, I don't want to just say a blanket, of course not, that it's never happened in all 50 states, but um, we have not seen that to be a significant problem. Um, but we are going to do everything we can to put some of those safety nets and things in place. The, the good news is I think there is a vast amount of support for what we're doing. Again, otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here if there wasn't. And so I, I feel like um, here we're in a good place. And again, um, I'm certainly going to fight for those protections over the course of the next seven years and hope that somebody that comes behind me will carry on um, with those same priorities and make sure that those continue to be part of our legislative uh, rules and packages. By the way, as a talk show host, I can't ignore that you just said in the next three to seven years you yeah. hope to be here, so I can't let that go because everybody's talking about you as perhaps leaving here for another gig, and I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> was that was that a bit of news, that that's not the case for you? Uh, it wasn't news to me, so um, <laughs> I'm, I, you know, I, I love Arkansas, and I feel like I just got started here with one year in office really, really proud of what we've been able to accomplish in the first year, but have a really long list of things I still want to see happen. And uh, like we started, I'm very biased in what I hope happens in the election. I'm going to do everything within my power to see that Donald Trump get reelected, but I look forward to serving as governor for seven years. 
another seven years, I should say. <laughs> other questions for the governor? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Got a mic for you there, Robert. Relative to the accountability issue, um, we as Christian schools, we want to hold ourselves to the highest degree of accountability, obviously. Are there any red flags that maybe the state Department of Education uh, would see? Uh, how, how, can we, uh, how can we best uh, hold ourselves accountable? Is it attendance? Is it finances? What, what would be some red flags that might put us on a radar of the, of the state Board of I, Education? I think one of the, the biggest things, and Keith, you may even want to jump in here on this because you worked so closely on this with us, but one of the biggest places that we really want to focus on is student growth and achievement. Um, and so making sure that there is uh, some sort of accountability and mechanism to measure for that. And so looking at how we see student performance, and I think it's really important that it's not simply based off of achievement. That growth piece is really critical. Um, a lot of students are coming in at very different places. And so making sure we aren't just measuring did they pass or fail, but how much progress did they make is really critical, I think, um, for that accountability piece. And that'll be one of the biggest places uh, that I want to see us lean into and look at. The other piece is always going to be accounting. You want to make sure that money that we are investing at the state level, whether it's in a school or education uh, or in our prison system or health care, that our dollars are being used correctly and properly. And so that would be the two places that I certainly would look at um, and I expect will be part of the rules and regulations process over the course of the next year. Other questions? Yes, sir. Governor Sanders, thank you. Uh, uh, now that the EFA voucher programs are in place, uh, are the continued funding for the program, will it be contingent upon surplus revenue that comes into the state on a yearly basis? We've set money aside um, anticipating what we think the level of participation will be, and so we feel very confident um, from our perspective that we're prepared for the next several years, even without that surplus. Always uh, surplus is a benefit, not just for that, but so that we can continue to do things like phase out our state income tax, uh, but we have put money aside specifically for this program for that purpose. Are, are parents and families aware of it, Governor? Is that is that part of it? Do you suspect if people, more families are aware of it, obviously more would jump in? Is that the issue right now? Absolutely, and I think as you have um, more awareness, you're going to see the participation level increase, but also as we get deeper into each phase of implementation, you're going to see the participation. Uh, it's a more limited pool in year one as we get the program up and started. For us, it was very important. It was very important that we get it right, not just get it fast. And so we wanted to phase in over time, really prioritizing the highest need students. And so we've been able to do that in year one. We'll expand that pool in year two. And then by year three, uh, again, it'll be open up uh, for every family to participate. Other questions for the governor? This one uh, is very questionable. Uh -oh. so. Governor okay. Sanders, thank you so much yeah. for your leadership of our state and your governance. Um, you have a room full of school leaders, um, respected in their own right. What sort of leadership advice would you give this group who wants to lead well? Ooh, tough question. <laughs> in, in, in full disclosure, uh, all three of my kids are being educated at his school, which is why I gave him a hard time. So but, not exactly the Associated Press over there is what yeah, you're saying. Uh, I, you know, I, I think no matter what role you're in, um, whether it's business, politics, education, um, the probably best piece of advice that my dad ever gave me and certainly something that I think is applicable in every area of life is uh, to always be yourself, be who God created you to be uh, because he created each one of us with unique skills and um, made us the way he wanted us to be. So don't try to be somebody else. So don't try to copy exactly what you see the leader of another school doing. That doesn't mean you can't take best practice and implement them into your school, but don't try to be somebody other than who God created you to be. Uh, that served me pretty well up until this point, I feel like, um, and so I think it's good life advice no matter what area or walk of life you're in. 
In all sincerity, the issue of universal parental choice seems like a no-brainer, sincerely. I, I can't imagine every governor in the country wouldn't want to go to the families of their respective states and say, choose your school. I, why, why is it so difficult for some of them, do you think? I think any time that you are trying to implement or bring about significant bold change, um, you're going to you're going to meet resistance. Um, no matter what arena that's in, uh, people, as much as they say they want something different, when you actually start to do it, you are generally surprised by how much pushback you may receive um, because people actually like comfort and the consistency of something being the same. And so when you have that level of change, you're going to meet resistance. Uh, but typically, I have found um, that... Uh, the most important things are not always going to be easy. And so we have to lean forward and continue down that path, especially if we know that the results and the outcome are going to be the best thing that we can bring about. And I feel like from my perspective, the best thing that we can do, uh, certainly in the state of Arkansas, hopefully across the country, is really empower parents to make the best decisions possible for their kids' future. And I think the only way that you can really empower a parent is by letting them have more say in their child's education. We'll do one more for the governor. Yes, sir. You want the mic or? Yeah. Oh, uh, Vice President. I'm sorry, Governor. Um, <laughs> you went on a tour this fall or, or this summer about the Learns Act. I saw you at Mountain Home at the shed. 99% of what you talked about was how it was affecting public schools. I surveyed my families of 180 kids, and about 80% said, I need more information on this. So when is your tour to private Christian schools going to be around the state to get that information out? Because you just made the comment that parents don't know enough about this. So when are you coming to Mountain Home Christian to... Uh, <laughs> or I don't know how many places you went this, this summer, but there was a number you went to around the state, I know, to to share with the schools about the Learns Act. So have you thought about something like that to help us? I have, and part of the reason I'm here today is for that very purpose. Um, hopefully you'll take this information and relay that back to your communities. It's difficult for me to get to every single school across the state of Arkansas, but we're certainly trying to uh, get to as many as we can, both public and private, um, and not just me, but members of the legislature, as well as Secretary Oliva, uh, who runs the Department of Education, who's done a phenomenal job helping us get that message out. But just to be fair, uh, those events that we held all over the state were open to everybody. Um, and so we wanted uh, people from the homeschool community, the charter school community, public and private schools to come and hear all of the various aspects of the Arkansas Learns legislation. Um, we're going to continue uh, to spread that message. One of the things that we have been able to do over the last several months um, that have been, I think, incredibly informative, but also uh, helping answer questions and address um, you know, concerns that citizens have is we started something called Capital for a Day, where uh, I have taken our entire cabinet as well as the majority of our senior staff into communities around the state, and we spend an entire day um, going to schools, going, uh, having open forum town halls, um, meeting with business leaders, local leadership, so that we can address concerns not just on education, but on all of the various topics that may come up and that a certain community may be dealing with. I think it's been incredibly successful. It's certainly been helpful uh, from our perspective. There have been things that have come up. I was in a local uh, county DHS office, and one of the ladies who answers the phones uh, alerted us to a way that we just input data into the computer system, said if we could just make this small change, it could save us hours upon hours of work and add a lot more efficiency uh, to them being able to then serve more people. And we were able to quickly make that change by the following week. And so those are some of the things that we're trying to do. We'll continue spreading that message on education. Um, been to Mountain Home many times and uh, certainly look forward to coming back and we'll be glad to visit your school when I am. 
Governor, it is, uh, I know I speak for Arkansans, though I'm not one, but I speak as just a parent uh, across right, the country. All right, everybody has downfalls, Chris. We'll, let you, <laughs> we'll, we'll be happy to let you relocate here. I will tell you, though, that sincerely, uh, there are not many of you who've been willing to be this bold on behalf of uh, students and families. And so I think on behalf of everyone in the room and parents across the country, thank you for your bold leadership on this issue. Governor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Governor Sanders.